tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Welcome fellow Heartlanders to week two of Fear from the Heartland. I am your host, Paul J. McSorley. People sometimes ask me why I emphasize the J in my name. My answer, I'm weird. You remembered me doing it. And I spend a lot of time in a padded room. It's week two and we have two stories. Coincidence? Probably. They're really different, cool tales. I wouldn't be surprised if Eli Pope and J.C. Field spend time in a padded room as well. Let's get after it, and thank you for being here. Clyde's World is written by award-winning author Eli Pope. Clyde is an obsessed author with worries about either finishing his story before death overtakes him, or at the least, choosing a writer who could finish his story the way he would if death wins out first. His younger wife holds obsessions of her own. She longs for physical love, and the two are unable to come to terms with the other's distractions to a point of finality. And now, for your indulgence, Clyde's World. Chapter 1 Clyde and Rachel Clyde, won't you please come to bed with me? It's late, honey. My eyes ached from the strain of staring into the screen hour after hour. The screen, though, is my vehicle. My vehicle to the world I've been creating and now wished I could escape into. I glanced over at Rachel. She looked enticing with her long leg lying outside the sheets covering the rest of her voluptuous body. But damn it. I had a manuscript to finish. In fact, I needed to write several books to finish the series. My novel started out a standalone, but I got rave reviews, and fans had begun to purchase ebooks and paperbacks. If I had learned one thing, you don't ignore your fans or move them to the back burner. They're your lifeblood. Not just financially. There's something addicting about being acknowledged and praised for your work. Hell, the publishers certainly never do. Most won't even affirm a new writer's existence in the publishing world. To the agents and big house publishers, we indies are just annoying emails to delete, manuscripts to shit can, and phone calls to ignore. No, Rachel, you know I have to get this finished. Clyde, I need you over here. Stop wasting away in your make-believe world mental banging your perfect female characters when you have a hot live one right here 15 feet from you, lying naked in bed begging for your attention. I felt movement down below the belt. I'm not dead. I'm just invested in powering through while I've been lucky enough to avoid the dreaded writer's block. Besides, if I were to die today, I'd leave my readers empty and stranded in a world only I can build. Only I can take them where they need to go. I thought for a moment about the internal statement I'd just made to myself. What if I did die? I haven't felt normal forever. Rachel, did you leave something on the stove? I smell fire or smoke. Something's burning. Maybe coffee or feathers? 
something. No, and I don't smell anything. Again for the umpteenth time tonight. You should see a doctor. There's something wrong with your nose. Hell, there's something horribly wrong with your libido. Please come to bed. I knew I was taking Rachel for granted, and she deserves so, so much more. But my antagonist was about to make his move. The speed my fingers were tapping on the keyboard instantly maneuvered my brain to reel my attention back to the story my readers craved. Hell, I craved. The creative control I held over an entire universe, albeit digital, was far more irresistible to me than attempting to please my oversexed wife in bed across the room. Was I sick? I'm sure I had several author friends who'd be thrilled to be banging my beautiful wife, but their priorities were never aligned in the proper balance to be successful. I want to be the star, the Stephen King of 2021. There's that goddamn smell again. Something is hot and about to burst into flames. Rachel, please go check the kitchen. There's something burning. Do you want the two of us and Botch to burn up tonight? I glanced down and Botch, our lazy American bulldog, was on the floor lying midway between Rachel and me. He was snoring and wouldn't budge if the devil's flame was about to singe his asshole, unless a meaty snack was involved. Rachel threw the sheet off the rest of her body with a grumble as she landed her leg off the edge of the bed to the floor. Her nearly naked body sauntered down the hallway in disgust. Botch broke his snore long enough to lift his head to see where Rachel was headed. He must have sensed she wasn't going to get him a snack, so he laid his head back down and began instantly snoring. She had walked past me and I noticed one edge of her red panties were nuzzled up the crack of her ass. I did look away from my world on the monitor long enough to briefly appreciate the way her body jiggled down the hallway, like peach jello sitting on a serving plate during an earthquake tremor. She was a beautiful young lady and my being 12 years older now seemed to have an adverse effect on my desire to throw her down and make love like wild monkeys on ecstasy. Turning my attention back to Walter, my psychotic antagonist, and what he was about to do to Megan made my heart pound. He was going to change her world, but even more than that, he had changed the readers' worlds. When this book was published, fans would certainly deny hours of sleep in order to burn through pages to find out the outcome. In the reflection of my screen, I could see Rachel bouncing back apparently finding nothing on fire but her anger for me. She was given the perfect body for a pissed off woman who loved dramatic entrances. Her voluptuous body, along with attitude, commanded attention no matter where she was. She had commanded mine as she somehow picked me out of a crowd of newbie authors at the New York City Writers' Convention five years ago. I wasn't sure what she saw in me when she smiled, but hell yes, I was eager to introduce myself. We shared great times, ferocious lovemaking, and only six months before a wedding in uptown Manhattan. The honeymoon is over, and now she just seems to be a lubricious exotic distraction from the world I've been called to create. The one beckoning me to spend my time within. If it weren't for Walter standing in the shadows of Megan's darkened room, in the house she lives in on Macon Street in the little burg of Appleton Coast, I'd take Rachel in my arms and ravage her luscious body until my heart gave out or I stroke. But I have responsibilities now. I couldn't let myself die even in the throes of unbridled passion with my vivacious wife willing to fulfill any carnal whim I asked. Not when my fans were waiting with bated breath on what Walter would do. The only thought in my mind now was if I died, who would continue my Walter K. Guile series? And I'm going to die. I feel it. I smell it. It hovers over me like a dark foreboding storm. And I'm very uneasy about what to do. Who to trust with my masterpiece? Who would continue the macabre world I've created? Who could I trust? My mind feels like it's slipping, losing its creative drive, melting. Rachel walked up behind and before I could react, she reached over my shoulder and plunged an ice pick deep into the wooden top of my desk, making a loud thud. She leaned over further, her head blocking my view of the screen, nudging her soft fleshy breasts tightly into my cheek and chin, then sharply whispered, Next time, Clyde, 
this may be your back it finds. What the fuck is wrong with you? You're obsessed, and I have needs, baby doll. And she shoved me so hard my head almost clipped the monitor's sharp edge before she climbed into bed, making sure I was very aware of her presence. I turned toward the bed and saw her ass barely covered by the frilly red panties wiggling into a comfortable position while she huffed. It was as if she could feel my eyes scanning her rounded hips when she turned her head back my way, eyes shooting daggers at me. I hope your little dick falls off from lack of use, Clyde. I'm not going to wait around forever and let my flower wilt away to nothing. This garden needs some steady watering from one hose or another. And then she snapped her head back into her pillow, facing polar opposite of me and my computer screen. I could feel the chill in the room immediately, but the draw of the scene I was working on pulled me back in and I focused on the action going down in Megan's bedroom. My fingers could barely keep up with my brain busily laying the descriptive prose which led Walter Kendall Giles to his eighth victim and Megan's last horrifying night. I was great at descriptive terror and I knew how to make the girls scream. More than once I'd felt the urge to take it past the keyboard and into the flesh itself. But for now my readers needed fed and until I could find the new chef who could handle preparing this meal, I'd dodge the first and last real kill before my own journey into the next world. It seemed I'd escaped death tonight from the ice pick I'd left out beside my bottle of Dewar's 12-year-old scotch. I gripped its wooden handle and attempted to pull it from my desktop where Rachel embedded it. It took both hands to retrieve. Chapter 2 The Novel Walter hadn't always been a bad guy. In fact, he was quite the contraire. He had been kind to people most of his life. Many thought he was quiet and different, but he had never caused anyone to worry or fear him. Walter grew up in a foster family, and while he loved them, he didn't much care for them. He knew they had taken him on because his mother had left him, abandoned him as a five-year-old after treating him like her best friend. He had never known his father. The man just told his mother he loved her until he got what he wanted. When she had told Walter his father left because he had gotten more than he bargained for, Walter didn't seem to get it. It didn't bother him and he had really only remembered Mama being around anyhow. He did grow up quicker than most kids his age. It was out of necessity. Mama stayed away up past his bedtime and, in return, she slept in much later than Walter did. He rummaged for food to eat from the refrigerator and cabinets on his own from the time he had grown old enough to realize where the food was kept. The world he had been relegated to. He knew no different. Mama and he celebrated birthdays and Christmas, Easter, all the major holidays much like any other child who grew up with their parent or parents. His mother loved him and he knew it. She told him she loved him to the moon. He knew it meant she cared for him a lot. What he didn't realize was his mama owned problems of her own. She had food to buy, bills to pay such as rent, utilities, insurance, and so on. He didn't realize she had been slipping on all those. He also didn't know what she did for a living. He didn't know some would think his mama was too dirty and unfit to take care of him. One day it all ended. His world became very different. Mama had to leave. She hugged him tightly and said she would be back but he went to live with someone else. Someone else who had their own children. Mama visited two or three times and then never came back. He had turned five when the bubble he lived in collapsed. He cried for Mama night after night. At first, the new family tried to console him and tell him everything would be all right, but he didn't believe them. He cried for Mama. The new family's mother began to scold him for it, and then she'd threaten him with punishment if he didn't stop. Walter just wanted to see his mama. Nothing else mattered. She was his world, as imperfect as it was. He now lived in darkness. Or at least, it's what it felt like. Walter finally realized she wasn't ever coming back. She must have found another little boy who didn't argue. One who did what mama asked him to do. He no longer liked mama. He loved her, but he didn't like her anymore. And if he were ever to see her again, he'd tell her so. After he hugged her, of course. As he got older, he'd slip off in private to cut himself. 
It gave him life. It sounded crazy, but it did help release some pain. Walter continued to live with his new family, although he never felt like they were truly his. He loved them, but he didn't like them. Walter left his foster home when he turned 18. It wasn't long after he lived on his own, he started looking for his mama. He quickly found there were lots of women who looked like the way he remembered how mama looked. When he'd look into their eyes, he'd see his mama in them, along with the lies of loving him and coming back to get him. He loved each one of the women who reminded him of mama, but he didn't like them. Walter soon devised ways to bring women who reminded him of mama back home. They may not have wanted to come, but he realized there were ways in this dark world to make them. He felt ashamed of how he would treat them, but it wasn't much different than how mama treated him. He was never cut by his mama literally. It was more a pain of her being there with him, but not really being there. It felt like cuts to his skin when mama would ignore him and continue sleeping telling him to go away or get his own food when he felt hungry. Walter decided cutting the women who looked like Mama would be a good way of punishing them for not coming back home like she promised. Not deep cuts, but shallow ones. Tiny ones which reflected the pain he had felt. This seemed to satisfy his hunger for the love he had waited for. The days that became months and then years of hoping she would come back. Eventually, he would need to find another Mama when the one he kept in his basement would quit crying, would quit begging, would stop moving. Today, though, he had stumbled onto Megan. It wasn't Mama's name and he knew it, but she certainly looked like Mama. The same brown hair and brown eyes, the same empty look as if she didn't really care about him. He'd take her home tonight, like she promised. Walter would show her what she had missed while she had been gone. Walter would help her cry like he had done for so many years like he had helped the others. He didn't like her, but he did love her because she was his mama. Chapter 3 The Doctor I knew something felt horribly wrong with myself. Lately, it wasn't only the different odors I picked up. They hadn't changed much. It's still always something burning. Leaves, feathers, electrical... I could never be certain, but the frequency increased and it irritated Rachel when I'd ask her if she could smell it too. But now I'm also getting sensations in my head, right behind my ears and eyes. A buzz or a high pitch felt almost like my brain hummed like an electrical circuit. Some of my author friends in our critique group said it could possibly be tinnitus. I didn't think so. I knew something was growing inside my skull, like an alien seed pod. Of course, it was a ridiculous notion, but the whole scenario began to affect my writing. I couldn't let that happen. My fans, my world I'd been building for them. Failing my readers wasn't an option. This moment is what my life's work was boiling down to. My legacy. My books were the only thing I had done to offer this world, and something like a tumor or sickness wasn't going to stop me. No one believed me, though, especially Rachel but death hovered over my back and it seemed to be gaining. Rachel was hounding me about going to the doctor and since I constantly smelled things no one else seemed to, I caved in and went to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. What could it hurt? Worst case scenario, I'd be right and I would need to buckle down and find my replacement writer to continue my series. Best case news? It just lived in my head and maybe a relaxing trip for Rachel and I would release the tension inside my brain. She had been trying so hard to pull me away from the computer. If the news was good, I'd go home tonight and shut down my writing and give Rachel what she had craved and deserved. I felt the familiar movement just under my belt. I'm sitting here in the middle of a bunch of old people waiting for my turn to be called, and I had a fucking rock-hard boner thinking about making love to my wife. I almost laughed out loud. Rachel would smile about this when I told her tonight right after I slid those bright red panties off. I suddenly felt like a high school football star about to score a touchdown. I hadn't even thought about Walter or my fan base. Clyde Bassett, please come to the front desk. Dr. Mills will see you now. 
I got startled and began to get up from my chair before I realized walking would be difficult with the situation in my pants. Rachel, I thought to myself. I quickly began thinking rainbows and unicorns, hoping the awkward tent would quickly retreat to an at-ease disposition. My hormones were now officially alive and well. Clyde Bassett, please come to the front desk. Two hours later and having my head placed in a round tube full of bangs, clings, and clatter, I waited in the room for any news. The doc walked in and I tried to read his face as he sat on the stool and began rolling up to me, reading the contents of the file he held and studying a photo. Without any fanfare, he looked up and said, There is a possible mass behind your temporal lobe which could be causing pressure. From this point on, I admit my listening stopped. The only thoughts bumping around my brain were, who could I get to finish my series and the fact I'd told Rachel I was dying, but she didn't believe me. I slowly sauntered out to my car in somewhat of a daze and climbed in, immediately put my keys in the ignition and started it. My mind swimming, overloaded with information I never wanted to hear. It's going to be a long 20 to 30 minute return trip home through the mountains depending on traffic. The doctor scheduled more tests and told me not to worry yet. A dark shadow of death cast over me, and I'm not supposed to worry? Yeah, Doc. What fucking world do you live in? Maybe Frank? Bill? No, Paul. It's got to be someone I know. They're all such different authors than me. Their writing isn't dark. Who, damn it? I rounded a tight corner when a song came on that I loved. I reached to turn up the volume looking up just in time to see the semi-truck coming across my side of the lane, I swerved. My Volvo sat on its top at the bottom of a deep ravine. It seemed my diagnosis now became unnecessary. Dead on arrival. Chapter 4 Clyde's Deal my head felt like it spun end over end until everything went dark. I instantly felt frigid cold, Antarctica cold. Then came the sultry heat as my eyesight awoke and unblurred. I looked at a screen in front of me. There were flames licking at the windows surrounding me. A dark silhouette sat in the corner of the room. I couldn't see a face, but I felt cold chills even though the heat made it difficult to breathe. The screen caught my eye and I couldn't believe what I saw. Frank, my supposed friend, was in my bed with Rachel, both naked and going at it like rabbits. Then the screen panned to the left and Frank now sat at my desk typing something he seemed only mildly focused on. I wanted to be able to see the words he typed and somehow I willed the screen to zoom in. You son of a bitch! I cried out loud. This banal crap of yours would never come from me. It would be obvious. Walter wasn't a rapist. He never made the women have sex. His endeavors were never about his sexual satisfaction. This is nothing like the story is supposed to go. The pros are... are... It's complete drivel. I became furious. Frank was raping my novel. I never thought he was capable of anything but maybe a high school senior creative writing one assignment. Why would Rachel pick Frank to complete my series? I'll become the laughing stock. And then the screen zoomed back out and pivoted to the bed. Mine and Rachel's bed. There was Frank again. His true passion, his sloppy body all over Rachel surrounded by sounds of slapping flesh. She had chosen him for the sex she had been craving from me. The acts I denied her because of my strife to become a wealthy, renowned author so we could retire and travel together. She did this to hurt me where she knew the pain would be greatest, fucking up my writing. She had stuck the ice pick into my heart figuratively. The thing is, it wasn't Frank banging my wife that hurt. I didn't care. Frank is raping my legacy. Could he be doing it intentionally? Or was he really such a lame writer? The dark figure in the corner let out a hissing laugh as it turned. Red eyes stared at me. They were the same bright blood red color as Rachel's frilly panties. I found no arousal when I saw the red in those eyes, though. 
I felt deep foreboding betrayal from both she and Frank. I withdrew my stare from the dark figure's red eyes and suddenly smelled something familiar. Something burning. Light gray smoke smoldered over the dark silhouette and the smell of scorching feathers caused me to choke. The figure cackled a laughing sound as its eyes brought the pain of flame to my skin. I suddenly knew where I'd ended up at. The questions I'd spent a lifetime mocking about heaven and hell suddenly engulfed me when I realized that flames surrounded the room I now sat. It would be hell, and the dark figure must be Satan himself. It seemed I'd made a poor choice when I'd scoffed at Marcy back in Sunday school all those years back as a child. I'd laughed at her attempts to redeem me from my sin. Hell, i just turned eight. How much sin could I have committed? Words of wisdom from the mouths of babes. Words ignored and left behind me. I pulled my eyes away from the corner and back to the screen. Frank sat typing again at my keyboard. Walter had cuffed each arm with zip ties to the bedpost, and he moved his hand slowly down her leg, staring intently into her eyes with warning. He took her foot and cuffed it to the bedpost at the base of the bed, smiling a nasty foreboding grin as he calmly asked the girl, Now see, this isn't too uncomfortable, is it? After securing her ankle, he lightly dragged the tips of his fingers back up the inside of her leg. Walter stared at Marcy so intently, looking as if he enjoyed seeing the terror in her face. You're special, Marcy. I've been waiting a lifetime to be here with you. Walter's voice trailed off to a cold whisper. Please, mister, please don't do this. Please don't hurt me, Marcy begged. You mustn't be loud, Marcy. I don't want to have to gag you. Again, his voice trailed off to a whisper. I just love pretty young, innocent ladies like you. Of course, I, I don't want to hurt you. Walter whispered as his fingertips trailed around to the opposite leg and down to her quivering foot. Frank, you fucking asshole, I yelled. Walter is not about sexual torture or rape. I became livid, the excruciation of watching this creep I'd call a friend butcher my life's work. I'd be known as a cheap horror erotica writer. This is everything I would never write. Cheap and overdone gratuitous garbage. My story is about love and suffering and neglect. Walter's only way of coping with the desertion from his mother. He cut his victims out of self-healing, not to gain sexual pleasure. Walter didn't really understand he'd been killing his victims. And how did Frank come up with the name Marcy? I looked to Satan with question. Another cackling laugh from the dark corner where the red-eyed devil sat. Helpless is all I felt as I returned my gaze back to the screen. Pain and fear and powerlessness overtook me as I watched the monitor change from words into live video action. Marcy, now tied to the bed, and Walter leaned over her with a knife slicing the waistband of her underwear from her torso. It was Marcy. She had grown up, but her face I recognized. And Walter looked exactly how I pictured him in my mind. How could it be? I turned back to the silhouette sitting in the corner. The sick bastard's red eyes glowed even brighter, its cackle louder and more hideous. It looked up and asked me a question. Clyde, do you play poker? You know what I like about the game. You never know what you'll be dealt. But you can make bank with either a great hand or a fantastic bluff. You must have balls to win, though. Do you have bubbles, Clyde? I got the nerve to respond. After all, what could this creep do to me? It couldn't be worse than watching my friend butcher and adulterate my life's work. I mean, I'm dead and in hell anyway, so I asked, Can you stop this? Well now, Clyde, do you care to play a game? <laughs> I felt the instant urge to look away but I forced myself to face my fear in hopes for the answer I prayed for. Funny, huh? Sitting in hell, asking Satan for a favor, and praying to a god I never believed in until now, that this cast-out angel would give me the answer I sought. If I wasn't scared shitless, 
I would have laughed out loud from the irony. You've got me over the barrel. I'm dead either way, so I guess I'm all in. Satan responded almost immediately, his voice a loathsome raspy tone resounding an echo of death and terror woven within each word it spoke. Glide, Kevin Bassett. He spoke slowly with focus accentuated on each of my names. Which would you save if it were possible? Your precious wife whom you ignored? Oh, your life's arduous works and certainly memorable legacy to the world you've left behind. I answered instantly with fervor. My written artistry without question. My wife didn't even wait until my body could be interned before she shacked up with Frank and allowed him to butcher my manuscript. The devil hissed a laugh loud to my response. Are you certain? There are no more cards to draw. No do-overs. You'd be famous. Still dead, of course, but many others have made the same choice you are faced with. His outline smoldered as he spoke, the burnt feather odor becoming ever more dank and nauseating. I'm all in, Satan. That is your name, isn't it? I prefer Prince of Darkness, but I answer to Satan. <laughs> A sizzling guffaw followed. This next part to seal our deal, so to speak, will end our little game and cause some brief pain. But it is necessary to call you the winner of this hand. The dark silhouette moved closer to me. I'll need you to hold your left hand out, palm facing up. I slowly did as instructed. My shaky hand reached forward hesitantly, and when I had extended it as far as I could, I slowly turned my palm upward. Looking into the two molten red pools were what appeared to be his eyes, I saw movement of a dark, shadowy object get closer until I felt the sharpest, deepest burning pain I'd ever felt. I couldn't bring my hand back. My muscles were powerless to do so. I'd never smelled burning flesh before, but I suddenly smelled sweet bacon, followed by sizzling death. I looked down at my palm and saw the word sucker, now seared and blistering in the palm of my hand. I turned to look at the screen to count my winnings. This time I saw Walter, in live action where he had stood moments ago, only Marcy wasn't the girl lashed to the bedposts anymore. It was Rachel, and her skin bore small cuts over its entirety. They were barely oozing any blood from them at all, but I could see Rachel's tears and hear her cries of sorrow and fear. She kept begging him to stop, but Walter's eyes gleamed with lust. She had come back, and he loved her but Walter kept dragging the shiny blade softly across her skin as Rachel stared at me, as if she were looking into the camera, into my eyes. There peeked a tear of sadness in Walter's eye, and it screamed of his torment. He had been lonely so long before Mama came back home. This time, he knew it to be real. It felt different. It felt like family. I watched Walter continue his homecoming ritual with Rachel, I felt two distinctly different sentiments. The first, I'd now become a truly famous author who would be remembered for his literary brilliance and portrayal of the human condition. And secondly, while I watched Rachel's pain she was forced to endure, the beginnings of a tear seeped from my eye, mirroring the one in Walter's. And I spoke a final monologue, hoping she could hear it straight from my lips. I loved you dearly, Rachel but I never really liked you. I sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, Clyde's World, written by Eli Pope. Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion lay dormant for decades, while life took him different directions. The stories never left, and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head, telling him to put them on paper. And put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for The Judgment Game and The Spark of Wrath, 
books one and two of the Mason Jar series, which you, dear listener, can hear on audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com. That's Eli, E-L-I, Pope, P-O-P-E, dot com. He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope, or search groups on Facebook, The Mason Jar Room. Tonight's second featured story, The Soldier, was written by award-winning author J.C. Fields. Every major religion has a concept of what happens to the human soul after death. In the Christian faith, the belief in an afterlife is a core teaching. The virtuous are rewarded with a place in heaven, and the wicked are punished in hell. In the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch, a late 15th and early 16th century artist, hell is depicted as a place of fire and perpetual torment. More contemporary artists depict hell as a crowded space where the wicked suffer unspeakable horrors together. What if they are all wrong? In the following story, an American infantryman in World War II discovers his sins as a civilian may cross over into what happens on the battlefield. May we offer, for your indulgence, the soldier. My numbing white light from simultaneous shell bursts scattered the men, some dead before they hit the ground, others screaming for a medic. The soldier flinched and involuntarily turned his head away, using his hands to shield his eyes. Beneath him, the earth rumbled and shook. More men appeared beside him running toward the source of the unrelenting volley of enemy bullets. An explosion above them rained force debris down on those beneath. Unsteady, he glanced to his left to see a fellow GI's chest explode, raining blood and tissue on anyone near him. Vertigo rocked his senses as he tried to get a grip on place and time. He fell face down onto the snow-covered, leaf-strewn forest floor. The clatter of tanks, human screams, and orders shouted in panic overwhelmed him. All around, the chaos of mechanized warfare bombarded his senses. Flashes, followed by the cracks of bullets on their way to unseen targets, created a violent thunderstorm in what otherwise would be a quiet woodland. Run! His mind screamed. Despite the cold, sweat stung his eyes. Wiping his forehead with his sleeve, it came back smeared in dirt and other men's blood. Survival instincts took over as bullets whizzed by over his head. Run! A glance behind and another ahead overwhelmed him with indecision. Do something. This will get you killed. The shouts of his fellow soldiers intensified as more men succumbed to the withering barrage of bullets. He decided to escape in the direction from which he had came. No. He couldn't. The soldier drew an unsteady breath. The only thing stronger than a need for self-preservation remained his fear of being called a coward by his fellow soldiers. As men raced past him toward the chaos, he rose to his knees, bloody knuckles pressing into the dirty and leaf-littered snow. Finally, he pushed himself to a standing position. Off to the left, a large tree offered a temporary hiding place to check himself for injuries. He slipped beneath the wide branches and patted down his body. No significant wounds. Every explosion in the nearby forest shuddered the ground beneath him. He pressed his back into the mighty oak, but found no reassurance. He shut his eyes tight as bullets struck nearby trees, creating geysers of loosened tree bark to sting his exposed skin. Clamping his palms over his ears, he gasped for a breath. The tightness in his stomach intensified as he could still hear the cries of dying men calling for their mothers. Franklin, get your ass going! This isn't break time! The voice of his squad's master sergeant on his right snapped him out of his paralysis. He stepped beyond the safety of the tree just as he heard a muffled grunt. The master sergeant fell to the ground next to him, a gaping hole in the man's chest, and lifeless eyes pointed toward the sky. Dusk descended over the woods, 
which added a surreal quality to his surroundings. Desperation for survival prevailed over his worry of being considered a coward. He picked up his rifle with both hands and ran from the carnage. Navigating through the growing darkness and trying to avoid stumbling over bodies made for slow going. Finally, he broke out of a tree line. He stopped at the edge of the dirt path, looked both ways for the enemy, then glanced at the sky where the moon glowed through a thin layer of clouds. He crossed the narrow opening into another canopy of trees. Relief settled over him when he saw other men, just like himself, fleeing the battle. An unknown force pushed him forward. He stumbled. Searing pain traveled up his spine. He fell to the snow-covered ground. Breathing grew difficult, and a calmness swept over him. Finally, he lay still. He stood in a kaleidoscope of swirling colors. Within the lights, he heard voices beckoning him to approach the brightness. His long-dead mother called his name, and he felt her hand on his cheek. Scenes from his childhood flashed past as he walked toward the center of the brilliance. He gasped with the next vision, his girlfriend offering her unclothed body to him on the night prior to leaving for boot camp. He watched as a door closed. The bright colors ceased and cold engulfed him once again. His heart skipped a beat when he witnessed the events of that fateful night in Chicago. His final image before total darkness overtook him was the gangplank on the ship he would board for the journey to the battlefields of Europe. Struggling to regain awareness, he remembered the date to be December 16, 1944, the location he and other members of the 9th Infantry Regiment were assigned by Allied Command was the Ardennes region of northeastern France. History would record this date as the start of the infamous Battle of the Bulge. Drifting in and out of consciousness, he lay in the snow succumbing to a feeling of ultimate peace. Against his wishes, he awoke. Silence dominated his surroundings. He rose to his knees as cold, stiffened joints quickly turned the effort into a painful ordeal. Challenged by the agony, he struggled to stand. The butt of his M1 Garand lay close by. When he reached for it, pain seared through his body. Slowly, the agony subsided, and he used the rifle to push himself erect and surveyed his surroundings. Except for unmoving bodies posed in grotesque statues of death, he stood alone. The snow-covered forest floor, crimson with the frozen blood of dozens of his fallen brethren, met his gaze. The vertigo returned. Trembling, he reached into his front pocket for his compass, but found the glass crack and the needle clattering around inside the small container. With a curse, he flicked the useless object into the brush. Orienting himself, he looked to the sky to find a gray overcast so thick the globe of the sun remained hidden. He knew the north to south path he crossed earlier lay behind him. So he turned to what he guessed to be west and set off to find other soldiers and an aid station. Thirty minutes into his trek, he reached behind for his canteen, only to find a huge hole. Tipping the container up, not even a drop of water remained. After taking a deep breath, he let it out slowly and stood still for a moment. Studying the terrain, he listened for distant sounds of men or tools of war. Silence. Even the sound of birds and animals were missing. Putting one foot forward, he started to walk. After navigating the woodland for hours, he could not tell if he was making progress or just walking in circles. Several times, he thought he recognized a fallen, burned oak he had passed earlier. The sensation unnerved him. As dusk approached, he determined maneuvering through the thick timberland at night would be a fool's errand. He stopped to gather leaves and a few pieces of dry wood. No easy task, as much of the surroundings were covered with snow. Eventually, his hard work paid off when the pile of wood and leaves flared. Satisfied with his efforts, he watched the flames grow. With the fire established, he used his mess kit to melt snow for drinking water. No matter how much melted snow he drank, his thirst would not subside. Time passed slowly as the only discernible light emanated from the flames. The snap of a twig nearby brought him to full alert. He grabbed his rifle and pointed it in the sound's direction. Who's there? Can you spare a wee bit of warmth with a fellow? 
Standing, the soldier kept his weapon trained in the direction of the voice. Come into the light, slowly. Show me your hands. The firelight flickered on something to the soldier's right. Pointing the gun in the direction of the object and voice, the shadow materialized into a man as it grew closer. The glow revealed a guy dressed in a mud-caked khaki uniform with leggings, a brody helmet, and an Enfield rifle in one hand. The man said, I don't mean to alarm you, laddie. I've heard that accent before, Southside Chicago. You're Irish, aren't you? Aye, you're a doughboy, right? Haven't heard the term for a while, but yeah, that's a strange uniform you're wearing. The man shrugged. Only one I've got. Sit, rest for a while. I believe I will, thanks, the soldier said. I'm with the 9th Infantry. 77th Division, 1st Battalion for me. Wish I had food to offer. The Irishman tilted his head. I, I know what you mean. He paused and gazed at the fire for a few minutes. How long you been out here? Yesterday afternoon. We fell under attack and I got separated from my unit. I've been out here all night and day, lost. Yourself? The newcomer didn't answer right away. Yesterday, huh? Yeah. You mentioned Chicago. That's where you're from? The soldier smiled. The name's Franklin. I'm from Dublin myself. O'Reilly's mine. Nice to meet you, O'Reilly. I've never been to Dublin. Nor I, Chicago. You haven't missed anything. The soldier kept his attention on the fire and placed a few more large tree limbs onto the flames. I can't seem to get warm. It's winter in France, laddie. No one can. He poked at the blaze with a stick. Sparks scattered and glowed with the disturbance. The Irishman looked at his companion. Good fire. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome, he paused. What's Dublin like? The Irishman smiled. Warmer than here. Franklin shivered. Why is it so damn cold? He paused as he concentrated on the flames. Finally, he asked. Have you looked for your unit? Yes, but I'm sure they pulled out a long time ago. You can hook up with mine as soon as I find them? The soldier frowned as he observed the Irishman. He said, You don't have an overcoat. A shrug answered the question. He held his hands closer to the fire and then studied the soldier. Have you seen much combat? No, this is my first. He paused. I've seen death up close before, but... Nothing like I saw yesterday. He took a deep breath, avoiding the Irishman's eyes as he let it out. O'Reilly did not respond except to stare at the flames. The two men remained silent for an extended length of time as the glow and the crackling flames seemed to be their only connection to the world. His thoughts drifted back to one night in Chicago. Finally, the soldier said, Chicago can be a rough place. Aye, so can Dublin. Yeah, I can imagine. He looked at his companion. Can I tell you something? Not the priest. I know that, but I need to tell someone. Go ahead. I might not listen. That's okay. The Irishman concentrated his attention on the flames. Franklin said, I got into a little trouble one night on the docks of Lake Michigan. You see, I used to work for a man who owned several bars in downtown Chicago. One night he sent me and another guy down there to pick up a load of bootleg booze from Canada. It seems he still had his contacts from Prohibition and a way to increase his profits by buying untaxed whiskey. Turning his attention to the soldier, the Irishman's expression stayed neutral. Anyway, a couple of cops interrupted us. Wiping his mouth with his coat sleeve, the soldier continued. Damn, it's cold. A nod came from O'Reilly. The cops wanted us to cut a deal, you know? Let us go and keep the booze. They said they'd look the other way while we got the hell out of there. When I said no, they tried to arrest us. Taking a deep breath, Franklin looked toward the cloud-laden sky. I shot both of them and slipped their bodies into the water. I joined the army the next day and left for boot camp a week later. That explains why you're here? What do you mean? When you told me you hadn't seen much combat, I wondered why you're here. 
I'm not following you. Do you believe in heaven and hell, my American friend? He shrugged. The fire doesn't warm you, does it? O'Reilly asked. No, it doesn't. And you're hungry, right? Famished. Thirsty? The soldier nodded. You probably melted snow to drink, didn't you? Another nod. Afterwards, you were still thirsty. Yeah. My friend from Chicago. You were in hell. The soldier blinked rapidly. What do you mean I'm in hell? You're joking, right? O'Reilly smiled. Am I? Think about it. You've been wandering around a forest for over a day looking for a road and can't find it. You see a tree you recognize or a funny-shaped rock you seem to remember. You walk in a straight line and still can't find your way out of the trees. Am I right? I got lost. No, you didn't. He paused. Get used to it. I've been wandering around this forest since 1918. I can't find my way out. And neither will you. Hell is supposed to be hot. Who said so? Are you a priest? The soldier frowned. I'm not Catholic. Doesn't matter. Hell is what torments us the most. I used to catch small rodents and roast them. It didn't ease my hunger, so I quit trying. I can drink water all day and I'm still thirsty. I can sit by a fire like the one you made and still shiver. We are doomed to walk this forest in the middle of winter for eternity. For a long time, the soldier studied the man who claimed to be from 1918. I don't believe you. His trust in those words not as confident as before. With a shrug, O'Reilly started to stand, but stopped and returned to the ground. Makes no difference if you believe me or not. You're in hell, my friend. The soldier smirked and asked in disbelief, Are there others like you? Thousands. I've seen them wandering around at night. However, you're the first one I've been able to have a conversation with. You're crazy. Am I? Think about it, Frank. Where are the sounds of war? It's happening all around us, and we can't hear it or see it. We're not part of it anymore. Franklin's eyes widened. He wiped his mouth with his hand. The lips felt cold. Studying the Irishman, he said, This can't be happening. Oh, but it is. I can't be dead. I never got shot. The only bullets you hear are the ones that miss you? Stop it. He placed his palms over his ears and stared at the man sitting on the other side of the fire. I didn't hear the bullet that got to me either. He pointed to his head. Got it right below me helmet. How come I don't see the others you mentioned? You will, but they won't talk to you? You mean I'll be alone? Yes. O'Reilly stood and started to turn. How come you're talking to me? Not sure. I saw your fire and thought I'd try. He paused. Maybe I'm being offered a form of clemency. If I show some kindness to you by explaining what's going on, I might get out of here at some point in the future. After I died, no one told me. I had to figure it out on my own. The soldier got to his feet. Wait, I don't want to be alone. I get the feeling my time is limited to talk to you. This can't be true. I don't feel dead. The Irishman chuckled. <laughs> I was dead supposed to feel, Franklin. I don't know. None of us know how death feels. Until we experience it. He turned again to leave. Why are you here? The Irishman looked back at him. I executed three German infantrymen after they were taken prisoners. Why? No reason other than they were German and no one was around to see me do it. Still not believing the man, he reached to stop him from leaving. His hand passed through the Irishman's shoulder. O'Reilly gave the soldier a sad smile. See, I wasn't lying to you. While Franklin searched for words, he watched the figure disappear into the night. For several moments, he listened for sounds around him. Silence. No birds chirped or creatures scurried through the leaves. Only silence. He looked skyward. Clouds raced past a full moon. A tear leaked from his eye and down his cheek. He stood still. For how long, he did not know. A mist formed as the fire flickered out. By the light of the moon, another figure approached his position at a slow walk. Thinking it might be the return of O'Reilly, 
He stepped away from the tree and watched the form approach. The clothes were wrong. The Irishman had not returned. The figure wore a German uniform. Franklin raised his rifle and shouted, Stop! The man ignored him and continued walking. Positioning himself in front of the oncoming soldier, Franklin shouted again, Stop or I'll shoot! The figure did not stop or slow. Finally, it passed through him. The only thing Franklin felt was a cold breeze as he watched the specter disappear into the darkness. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, The Soldier, penned by J.C. Fields. J.C. Fields is an award-winning and Amazon best-selling author. He is a full member of the Missouri Writers Guild and is active in numerous other writing groups. His Sean Kruger series has won numerous awards, including multiple gold and silver medals in the Reader's Favorite International Book Contest. The Imposter's Trail was awarded Best Mystery Thriller at the 2017 Ozark Indie Book Fest. In March of 2020, his novel, A Lone Wolf, became a number one Amazon best-selling audiobook. His second novel in the series, The Last Insurgent, became a number one Amazon new release in January 2021. All of the aforementioned books can be found on audible.com, narrated by yours truly. If you'd like to learn more about J.C. Fields, you can reach out to him at jcfieldsbooks.com. That's J-C-F-I-E-L-D-S-B-O-O-K-S dot com or bookbub.com slash authors slash j-c-fields. You can also reach him at facebook.com slash jcfieldsbooks. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.